Joining me now, Cash Patel, U.S. Uh, former U.S. Attorney, former Deputy Director of National Intelligence, former uh, Deputy uh, Department of Defense Chief of Staff, and author of uh, Government Gangsters. Cash, welcome back. You're an independent guy. I mean, let's start with the Trump uh, fiasco. What do you think? You're actually a lawyer and a former prosecutor. <laughs> Great to be with you, Larry. I'm also a former federal public defender, so I'm one of those unique lawyers who is on both the defense and prosecutorial side of criminal uh, justice matters. And for me, the main issue is the two-tier system of justice that has been established by both the state system and now the federal system. And in order to destroy it, you need some sort of wrecking ball to hammer its way through it. And I think for the political left, Trump has become that juggernaut, that wrecking ball that they've been trying to use since Russiagate to take him out. But I think it's going to backfire. When you have the campaign case, like the Hillary Clinton campaign dollar case to buy the Steele dossier, and DOJ refused to prosecute her, and every state attorney general refused to prosecute her because it was not a violation of the law. It resulted in a civil penalty. Why Donald Trump is being treated differently, I think, is an education process for many Americans that'll backfire on the left. I mean, Cash, look, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. You are. Uh, I'm not a legal beagle. You are. But all these other parties, uh, federal, Federal Election Commission, they've all mm. walked away from this. And I thought the uh, yeah. Jonathan Turley reference to former presidential candidate, former Senator Jonathan Edwards was quite interesting, too. That was a stronger case, apparently, and they couldn't touch him. And then your point about Ms. Hillary Clinton, I mean, there's a double standard. Actually, there's double standards running all through this. No, that's and you're absolutely right. And, you know, Jonathan Turley is going to be and so many others that you have are actually the legal geniuses on this one. And what I'm here to tell you about is how this plays out in an actual courtroom, having tried these cases. When you put a witness like a Michael Cohen, who is a convicted federal felon who served three years in prison for crimes of lying, fraud and deception, that's who this case is allegedly based on. So even if we put aside the two tier system of justice, you have the two tier system of criminal law practice playing out in front of a grand jury. Today, we know there was another witness who has no criminal history who went and countermanded the narrative put forth by Michael Cohen and his bias. So this grand jury, for all the wrongs this prosecutor has, this grand jury has a chance, albeit a low one since it's New York City, to correct the issue and not actually execute a pending bill of indictment. So we'll see how that goes. But even if it gets to trial, which will backfire even more on the left, I think the American public will see the characters, the Coens, et cetera, that we use to manufacture an almost decade-old case that no one else chose to bring. By the way, mind you, the Biden administration leading that charge chose not to bring it. Well, you know, um, years back, famously or infamously, uh, a well-known New York judge said, in New York, you can indict a ham sandwich. So that's what Alvin Bragg may be doing. <laughs> he may be indicting a ham sandwich. But let me ask you, um, in some sort of fairness to this discussion, is there any case at all? Uh, now, we're going to have Andrew McCarthy on the show later in the week, a distinguished mm -hmm. former prosecutor, conservative and great friend. Um, he was talking about some tax payment related issues with respect to the transfer of funds. I don't know enough about that stuff, mm -hmm. Cash. I'm just trying to establish, is there any sort of case that you can think of here? It's a really tough stretch, and it almost requires a legal fiction. You have to bootstrap a misdemeanor state-level charge to a felony tax, uh, excuse me, a felony tax issue. Combine oh, the two just to right. pierce the statute of limitations, and then you have to put in the substantive facts to back that up. It's a very, very, very tough hill. But that doesn't mean Andrew Bra Alvin Bragg isn't going to try it to get the political victory. I think that this case is all about. But again, it's going to put on the display the two-tier system of justice, which you have covered wonderfully on your show, and which America needs restored to a single-tier system of justice. Well, it would so be it's nice. So it's not weaponized for it political purposes. It would be nice. Purposes. Yeah, I'm so tired of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is Russia hoax, Russia hoax. Anyway, Cash Patel, what is um, Chinese President Xi doing in Moscow right now, in your judgment? 
I'm so glad you brought this up. He, unfortunately, is having a field day. Two of America's largest adversaries are together. They just brokered a deal between Saudi and Iran, the largest state sponsor of terrorism. And now Saudi Arabia and Iran are partners in allowing Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Now you have Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin getting together, combining economic forces, which you can speak to better than anyone, but on a national security front, providing the financial wherewithal and metallurgy and supplies to create weaponry to use against America. American and American intelligence infrastructure. This is not a good day for America. It's a terrible day for the world because we have been set aside on the global stage because of Joe Biden's failure to act diplomatically or otherwise when well, it matters. That, that's where I wanted to go. In other words, we are, whether it's a dollar short and a day late, as some people argue, and I, I think Biden's diplomacy a year ago was for no good. I mean, he said, they don't, how dare Putin go in to Ukraine? We're going to do this, that, and the other thing. And he went in anyway. We should have acted ahead of time, but we didn't. But anyway, water under the bridge. What I want to know is, why mm -hmm. can't the United States, this is an honest question, Cash, why can't the United States continue to provide weapons to Ukraine, but at the same time show some leadership with respect to, I'll just call them talks with Vladimir Putin. And I want to go back a long time ago to my former boss, Ronald Reagan, who had a huge military mm -hmm. buildup here, who did everything he could to stop Russian, Soviet Russian communism, uh, economically, militarily, and so forth and so on. But he was willing to talk to the Soviets at least in his second term. I don't see President Biden doing anything. I see him, in fact, opening the door to a guy like Xi, who is um, our adversary. He is our worst adversary. So what do you make of this? Where's Biden's diplomatic initiatives? It's an intentional decision not to engage. And look, Larry, you're my former boss, President Donald Trump, showed us how to do it. Me, as the chief of staff of the Defense Department, did usher in one of the largest budgets DOD has ever seen. But while we were able to manufacture and supply arms, not just for America, but for American allies, we were able to withdraw out of the never-ending wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia. So those things are possible if your commander-in-chief chooses to do so. But Joe Biden chose to go to Eastern Europe and Poland, and instead of hosting one single diplomatic talk between Putin's Zelensky and others, he said, we are going to fund the war to no end, and we will give you machinery, jets, and equipment, which will lead to American personnel on the ground. Make no mistake about it, this commander-in-chief is committing American blood and treasure to the Ukraine, like so many presidents before him did to Afghanistan, except President Trump, who chose intentionally to withdraw securely and safely. That is a decision a commander-in-chief with gall must make, and we don't have one on the world stage. In fact, he's nowhere to be found in these conversations. I mean, this is the thing is, um, look, I favor helping the Ukrainians. I understand the freedom issue. I understand the international law issues. I also understand mm -hmm. battlefield difficulties. Would it be such a bad thing for the United States to be supplying weapons and helping Ukraine, but at the same time to be holding talks with Putin and the Russians? Would that be so bad? No, I think if we did it simultaneously, it would show the American people and the world that we are not in this to just warmonger. We are in this for a peaceful, negotiated settlement so that not more Ukrainians, Europeans, Russians, Americans die on the battlefield. I mean, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as the chief of staff at DOD is a dignified transfer. And I will tell you, Larry, I never want to sit through one of those again. Burying our soldiers for another person's war is the worst thing I've ever had to do. And we can fight and combat against it by supplying our allies, but also by telling them and our adversaries that we need to come together on a diplomatic resolution behind the strength and threat of a kinetic one. And unfortunately, what we're now doing is not even a threat of a kinetic one. We're just dumping in money and arms and equipment, and we don't even know where it's going. That's a story for a whole nother day. But I bet you Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are talking about it right now, picking up American intelligence and weaponry everywhere they can, Le starting with Afghanistan and then bringing it into the Ukraine. Cash Patel, last uh, 30, 40 seconds. Um, you think she is promising lethal weapons to uh, Putin? 
Absolutely. They're doing it already in Afghanistan. There's no reason for him not to do it face to face. They're partners in Afghanistan with all the $85 billion of equipment that Biden left there. And they're advancing those talks in a three day summit in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They are going to provide the financial and ingredients behind the economic ones, the metallurgy, equipment, and machinery necessary to combine forces. They're going to fill each other's need. It is the ultimate quid pro quo. All right. Cash Patel, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it.